This is what you know as a computer. The laptop on your desk, the smartphone in your pocket, the gaming PC with all those fancy lights. They're everywhere, running our modern world. This is another computer, a quantum one. It's not in some office cubicle or a streamer's gaming setup. It's housed in a laboratory that's literally colder than outer space, operating on completely different rules of physics. They're a lot more powerful than your PC with its ultra processor, but what do they actually do? And why do they look like chandeliers hanging from the ceiling? That's what we're going to discover. But first, we need to really understand what's happening inside your laptop right now. Every photo, video, email, and program on your device boils down to one thing. Bits. These are tiny electrical signals that are either on or off. That's it. Just two options. We represent them as ones and zeros. Your laptop processes information by flipping these electrical switches billions of times per second. That Instagram post you just liked? That was thousands of ones and zeros being processed through silicon chips. Pretty straightforward stuff. Now, quantum computers? They use something called qubits instead of bits. And this is where things get weird. A qubit can be a zero, a one, or, get this, both at the same time. Yeah, and this is thanks to something called superposition, a quantum property that allows particles to exist in multiple states simultaneously until they're measured. It's better to think about your laptop's bits like light switches. They're either on or off. Qubits are more like, well, nothing in our everyday experience behaves like qubits. That's what makes quantum mechanics so mind-bending. But we're only just getting started. If you want to go deeper into the strange world of quantum computing, take a second to hit like and maybe subscribe too. There's a lot more where this came from. In fact, there's another quantum property called entanglement, which Einstein famously called spooky action at a distance. When two particles become entangled, they share a fate regardless of how far apart they are. So imagine I have two entangled particles. I send one to Mars and keep one on Earth. If I interact with my particle here, the one on Mars instantly reacts. Not after a delay, not after the information travels there, instantly. This defies our understanding of how information should move through space. But quantum computers harness this entanglement. When qubits become entangled, changes to one directly affect the others. This creates an interconnected system that processes information in a fundamentally different way than your laptop. Your laptop processes tasks one after another, or maybe a few at once if you have multiple cores. Even the most powerful supercomputers just do more of the same, running calculations in sequence or in parallel. Quantum computers, through superposition and entanglement, can process vast numbers of possibilities simultaneously. Google's 53-qubit Sycamore processor could represent over 10 quadrillion combinations at once, that's a 1 followed by 16 zeros. This is why quantum computers could eventually solve certain problems that would take traditional computers thousands of years. Google claimed their quantum computer performed a specific calculation in 200 seconds that would take the most powerful supercomputer 10,000 years. But that power and strength comes at a cost. See, your laptop is a marvel of engineering miniaturization. Billions of transistors packed onto chips smaller than your fingernail, all operating at room temperature. Until you try to game on it, then it becomes a nice hand warmer. Anyway, quantum computers? They're the high-maintenance divas of computing. Many quantum computers need to be kept at temperatures approaching absolute zero, colder than outer space, to maintain their quantum states. We're talking about minus 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. Why so cold? Because quantum states are incredibly fragile. Any tiny disturbance, heat, electromagnetic radiation, vibration, can cause decoherence, where qubits lose their quantum properties and behave like regular bits. Game over. This is why quantum computers often look like chandeliers with intricate systems of wires and tubes. The whole setup is designed to isolate the delicate qubits from outside noise. Many use superconducting materials that only work at these ultra-cold temperatures. While your laptop has a sleek aluminum case and fits in a backpack, 
quantum computers require specialized facilities with extreme cooling systems. You won't be taking one to your local coffee shop anytime soon. Either way, the most interesting part of these machines is on the inside. Take a look. While your everyday laptop runs on tiny silicon transistors, quantum computers work in a totally different way. They use special systems to create what are called qubits, the building blocks of quantum information. Some use superconducting qubits. These are basically tiny circuits made from materials like niobium. When you cool them down to near absolute zero, we're talking colder than space, they can hold quantum states. IBM and Google are big fans of this approach, using microwave pulses to control them. Then there are trapped ion qubits. These use individual charged atoms floating in magnetic fields. Yes, really. And lasers are used to manipulate their states. They're super stable, but a bit slower. You've also got photonic qubits, which use light particles. These are awesome for sending quantum information over long distances, but they're a bit trickier to use for actual computation. And finally, quantum dots, tiny semiconductor structures that trap single electrons. Their spin states work as qubits too. Each type has its own pros and cons, and honestly, no one knows which one will come out on top. It's kind of like the early days of classical computers, back when vacuum tubes and punch cards were cutting-edge tech. We're still in that Wild West phase with quantum, but the differences don't stop at the hardware. Programming these machines? <laughs> That's a whole different story. Your regular computer works with simple logic. ANDs, ORs, NOTs, built on binary code. We've stacked layers of abstraction over the years, from raw assembly to high-level languages like Python, but it all boils down to manipulating ones and zeros. Quantum programming, though, plays in a completely different arena. It's all about linear algebra and probability. Instead of clear-cut ones and zeros, you're working with probability amplitudes and using quantum gates to tweak qubits while keeping their fragile quantum properties intact. And get this. Quantum algorithms don't give instructions the way we're used to. They set up conditions, kind of like laying down a path, and then let the quantum system evolve toward the answer on its own. It's more like designing an experiment than writing a to-do list for your processor. So, with all this wild, futuristic tech, you're probably wondering, what are quantum computers actually good for? Like, can they run Minecraft? Yeah, not happening. At least, not anytime soon. Quantum computers aren't just supercharged laptops. They're not built for general tasks like browsing the web or editing videos. Instead, they shine in very specific, very complex problem spaces. Stuff that would make even the fastest supercomputers break a sweat. For example, factoring large numbers. <laughs> Sounds boring, right? But it's actually the backbone of modern encryption. If a powerful quantum computer came along, it could crack a lot of the security systems that protect our digital lives. That's why governments and cybersecurity experts are racing to build quantum-safe encryption before it's too late. Then they're simulating quantum systems, which is kind of poetic, honestly. Quantum computers are great at modeling other quantum things, like molecules or materials. That could lead to major breakthroughs in drug discovery, clean energy, and advanced materials. They're also promising in optimization problems, figuring out the best possible solution from a huge number of options. Think, the most efficient route for a fleet of delivery trucks, or the smartest way to invest across global markets. And don't forget machine learning. Some AI algorithms could see massive speedups when run on quantum hardware, unlocking new possibilities in data analysis and pattern recognition. The key thing to understand is this. Quantum computers aren't here to replace your laptop. They're more like powerful sidekicks, specialized tools for jobs that classical computers struggle with. In the future, we'll probably see hybrid systems where classical and quantum processors team up to tackle big challenges. So how do today's quantum computers actually compare to regular laptops? Well, it's not a simple head-to-head. -head. As of 2025, the best quantum machines have around 100 to 200 physical qubits. That might sound tiny compared to the billions of transistors in your laptop, but quantum power doesn't scale linearly. It scales exponentially. A small boost in qubits could mean a massive jump in processing potential. That said, there's a big catch. Today's qubits are still pretty fragile. 
they're noisy, they lose coherence fast, like microseconds fast, and that limits what we can actually do with them right now. To unlock their full potential, we'll need thousands, maybe even millions, of stable, error-corrected qubits. That's the holy grail researchers are chasing. IBM, for instance, has laid out an ambitious roadmap. They're aiming for a chip with 200 logical qubits by 2029, capable of running 100 million quantum gates. And by 2033, they want to hit 2,000 logical qubits. That's the kind of scale where we could start solving problems that are totally out of reach for classical supercomputers. But we're not there yet. Right now, we're in a stage called quantum utility, which basically means quantum computers can sometimes solve niche problems better than classical methods, but we haven't hit quantum advantage, where quantum machines consistently outperform all classical alternatives for problems that actually matter. We're close, but there's still a lot of road ahead. In the short term, you're probably not going to be firing up a quantum computer on your desk. Most people will interact with them remotely through the cloud. Companies like IBM, Google, and a bunch of quantum-focused startups are already offering what they call quantum computing as a service, kind of like how we use cloud storage or AI tools today. The real impact, at least at first, will be behind the scenes. You won't see it directly, but industries definitely will. Pharma companies, for instance, could speed up the discovery of life-saving drugs by using quantum computers to simulate how molecules interact. Banks and financial firms might get smarter with trading and risk prediction. And logistics companies? They could unlock better routes, saving fuel and cutting down on emissions. Big wins for the environment and their bottom line. Give it a few more years, and we might start seeing quantum breakthroughs in material science too. Think longer-lasting batteries, more efficient solar panels, maybe even new superconductors. So no, you won't be tossing out your laptop for a quantum computer anytime soon. But behind the scenes, there's a quiet revolution happening in labs all over the world. And it's going to change the game. We're talking breakthroughs in medicine, tackling climate change, and building stronger, smarter digital security. The quantum future isn't about replacing what we've got. It's about unlocking what we could do. Thanks for watching. If you're into this kind of mind-bending tech and want to stay ahead of the curve, go ahead. Like, subscribe, and tap that bell so you don't miss what's coming next.